right, hello folks. Thanks for joining us for this uh, ChefConf Online pre-recording session. Uh, if you have any questions during the talk, go ahead and use the Q&A panel. It should be an option at the bottom of your screen and we will answer questions at the end. And now I'll turn it over to our speaker. All right, hi everybody. Hopefully you can all hear me just fine. Um, so uh, today we're going to be talking about um, kind of how we ramp up new developers at SAP, and this will help you get some understanding of some basic stuff um, about Chef and about a lot of the, the terms that you're going to be hearing, like run list and converge phase and compile phase, and uh, what, what all that actually means. So we're gonna talk a lot about like how the Chef run actually works and stuff. Um, so just this is kind of what we're going to be going through. I'm going to give you a little background of like who we are and what we do and how we use Chef um, so that you know I'm not some guy who read a book on Chef and now thinks I'm qualified to give a talk. Um, we'll go through some of the general best practices uh, that you can expect to, to kind of consider at least um, with regard to coding in general and the best practices that we use as far as getting uh, devs and operations to kind of work together and act kind of like a DevOps unit. Um, we're going to go through the anatomy of a cookbook and talk about uh, understanding how the chef client run actually works and how all the different pieces in the cookbook fit into that chef run. And then finally, we're going to talk a bit about um, the chef infra server and how you use centralized management and organizations to um, set up uh, different landscapes or, or different lines of businesses or applications and whatnot. So without further ado, um, SAP, where I'm coming from uh, today, um, our goal is to help the world run better and improve people's lives, um, which sounds great. And what does that really mean is that uh, we, we write and distribute software to help uh, other companies of all sizes in all lines of business from manufacturing to um, retail, we help these businesses to streamline what they do, spend less time in redundant, unnecessary tasks using software to automate and simplify their processes. And then beyond that, bringing insight to action, allowing people to take data from their systems and make it mean something. I heard a really awesome story about this type of insight to action the other day, and it's it's super relevant since we're talking about um, you know all, all of the things that are happening in the world right now and why we're even having this conference remotely, virtually. Um, there's a, a chain of restaurants in the the Midwest and East Coast, and their data uh, about um, about how many people are in there and what their sales are like is so accurate and so real time that the weather stations actually use data from their restaurants to help predict the flow of storms because as the storm's moving through, their chain of restaurants experiences downtime in the peak of the storms. So as the storm moves through, you can see in the, the real time sales data of this restaurant chain, how much um, where, where the storm is going and how much it's impacting, and how large it is. So, so this idea of insight to action is really um, a big part of, of what we do. Um, more specifically, uh, my team, the DevOps COE, um, we're here to enable dev and ops teams to work together. We try and build bridges between these teams so that ops can think and act a little more like devs and and really start to embrace the idea of infrastructure as code. And then on the other side of the fence, we can help devs better understand how their code really lives and breathes in the, the operational environment and uh, get a better, um, deeper engagement there. So we consult on and we develop automation with the ultimate goal of producing CI CD pipelines. And, and we also have centralized service offering. So we have, for example, a chef server that we open up to all of SAP to use 
um, and then you know the teams can do with that what they need to do. We also have uh, UCP, which is a unified cloud portal. And the unified cloud portal allows uh, people within SAP with limited knowledge of the actual uh, underlying details of each different hyperscaler uh, to go in and provision machines, run automation on those machines, uh, manage those machines, and it, it takes care of the whole life cycle without people having to figure out and invest in that learning curve of learning the, the Google CLI or the AWS CLI or figuring out how to get into the AWS console and what, I mean, if you've ever been in the AWS console, like the myriad of things that are in there and which ones are actually relevant to what you're trying to do. So UCP kind of takes all of that and wraps it into one easy, uniform, uh, packaged interface. Um, and then on that team, me personally, I'm the global team lead. Um, one of my jobs is to onboard new team members. And uh, that's a lot of what we're going to talk about today is um, this, this chef part of the onboarding process. And another part of my job, uh, along with a couple of um, our top developers, um, our technical specialists, is to set guidelines and best practices. So we set these guidelines and best practices that we uh, then distribute to the rest of SAP and let people um, you know, kind of understand and work the way we work so that they can do the best that they can do. Um, so best practices. Um, and, you know, the first part of that is how do, how do we get ops to think like devs and devs to think like ops? Obviously, we're not going for like some huge um, rainbows and, and puffy white clouds kind of you utopia where everybody knows what everybody else does and totally understands it. But we need to, to build this basis of understanding and, and we do that by identifying some key areas and some key differences in the way these two different departments uh, tend to work. So from the operation side, you've got um, a, very, um, a very different type of work environment than you do on the development side. So on operations, you have a lot of script-based automations. And when you do script-based automations, you're, you tend to be doing a lot of um, of run line type of scripting. I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna set this variable, and then I'm gonna use this variable here. And it doesn't really tend towards a whole lot of um, like object-oriented um, higher level programming. Maybe a bit more now with the, the advent of PowerShell for Linux and things like that, but in general, not a whole lot of object-oriented programming. There's also a lot of real-time response to changes. If there's an issue on a system, it has uh, like all of these processes around it where there's maybe some monitoring and there's maybe, you know, like um, some kind of notification system going on, tickets get created, issues get worked, and, you know, we're, we're shooting for what, you know, three or four nines of downtime, right? So we really want to make sure that those systems come back up and are usable as fast as possible. And, and so that means there's a high focus on stability. Um, as far as bringing up new instances, new services, uh, applications on, on those uh, servers tend to be based on a very specific set of instructions. And, and here I'm talking about applications that come over from development, right? Um, we need this and this and this thing to work just like this, right? Not necessarily with a huge understanding of what all that's doing on the development side, what that application is really doing. We just know we need these files here. They have to have these permissions. And, and we have this very, very narrow scoped view of an application in general. Um, a database is another great example of that. When you've got a, a database that you've set up, um, generally the even the database admin on the op side doesn't like fully understand all of the things that go into what the application is doing with that database we're not adding intelligence there to the the process of administering the database more we tend to be um, setting up the database per these requirements and and we know what these requirements do and what they mean and we can give some advice there um, but but not with the, the holistic view of the application. 
Um, operations also has a lot of recurring activities like maintenance and patching and things like that. Um, so these are, are cyclic, but they're a little bit longer running usually, especially when you're talking about a large organization like SAP and we're managing thousands of servers. Um, the, the maintenance activities and the patching are gonna be generally kind of staged. We plan downtime. Uh, maintenance windows, things like that to take care of that. Um, and as I kind of alluded to before, there's like numerous tools to manage all this stuff. You've got your monitoring tools, sometimes more than one. You've got your um, your notification tools, like so you're being monitored, but then you've got to, when, when something comes up in the monitor, something's got to notify and who's it going to notify for which systems and there's systems that are maintained for all of those different pieces a ticketing system, often more than one. Um, and so what you have in, in operations is generally, especially in, again, large, large enterprises, is you have a high degree of knowledge dispersion. The active directory guy is the active directory guy. And if you've got a really big organization, then you might have one guy who's working just on group policies in active directory and another person who's working on um, you know, the, the actual organizational units and, and who goes where. And those guys don't really deal much with the databases and the database guys don't really deal with the, the backup guys and the backup guys don't really deal with the, um, with the file system necessarily, right? So like there's a whole lot of big uh, dispersion in, the, in these giant teams to do this. Now on the other side of the fence, you've got your developers and your developers are working in planned work units, right? And often we're talking about scrum teams, they're working in sprints, they have a cyclic release schedule every day, week, two weeks, month, six months, whatever that happens to be, right? But you plan your work through the sprint and you work through that. And there's not a, generally not a whole lot of interaction with that production landscape. You work your bit of the code, your bugs, your features, whatever it is that you're doing, and then beyond that, you bring it back into master, your tests get run, and you don't really know what happens to it after that. You've probably got, you know, on some level of the team that, you know, between these two, there's a couple of people that kind of sit on the fence between both to manage that handover. But from the development side, there, there really isn't those developers that are actually pounding out the code uh, aren't aren't a part of that system. Um, you have a highly controlled uh, work environment. And what I mean by that is your actual workstation as a developer is very, um, very structured. Uh, so you've got your IDE, you've got your source code repository, you maybe have some linting tools, but there's a very specific set of things that you have as a developer for XYZ product. And most of your other uh, developers on your team are going to have pretty much the exact same configuration. Um, and then you have knowledge pillars for specific topics. And this doesn't tend to be to the great degree of the knowledge dispersion that you see in operations. Instead, you have like, you have a guy who really, really knows um, cryptography and, and he helps everybody out when they have questions about cryptography. And you've got maybe another guy who knows a lot about some other topic like um, bitmap rendering, right? And, and that's the guy to talk to when you wanna do anything with, with like images and understanding, you know, bitmaps versus vectors and things like that, right? Um, so you have these, these kind of highly specialized uh, knowledge pillars, but they're not as disparate from from the rest of the team, right? They're all kind of mixed in there together. They're all kind of pretty accessible. And, uh, and it's not so much that they have a responsibility area in those topics. It's just that they have the broader knowledge there. And then you also have scoped responsibilities. So what we talk about in scoped responsibilities in a dev team is you've got like, you've got your scrum master, you've got generally um, in the teams that I've worked with, there's usually a group that handles bugs during a sprint and another group that handles features during a sprint. Um, 
And often in these teams and some of the best teams I've seen run, um, these guys all rotate. So the, the bug team might be working on bugs this sprint and the next sprint they might be working on features and uh, you know, that the scrum master might rotate through the team every couple sprints, they pick a new scrum master and uh, that gives everybody a, a chance to deepen their knowledge of all of the, all of the parts of the code base so that nobody is an island. Um, also in development, you know, and it kind of goes without saying, but developers are going to have a very deep knowledge of programming paradigms. Um, you know, not just, um, you know, the abstraction of programming and, and the object model, right? But also like some of the simple stuff that we kind of uh, take for granted if you've, you know, done much programming at all, you, you have this intrinsic knowledge of um, variable types and classes, right? You can ask a developer to uh, overload the string class to do a special function and they'll get that, right? That, that'll be a thing like, okay, yeah, I know what you're talking about. I may not know how to do it in this language or um, I may never have done that before, but, but I understand like what you're talking about. Whereas on the operation side, the difference between a string and array might be even a hard thing to like get up to speed on. It's, it's a new, new concept at least. But then on the other side of the fence, the developers generally don't have like that deep knowledge of IT topics like networking, disk volume management services, um, DNS, right? These are things that, that the developer might not really have a deep knowledge of. And, and that's something that most of the operations guys would. So the, the goal here is is in this whole process of being DevOps, we want to try and not necessarily make everybody understand everything from the other side of the fence, but we want to build a bridge so that they at least know what they don't know and, and they can appreciate what's happening on the other side of the fence rather than it being just a black hole. On our team, we get people from both sides of this fence. We have people from the operation side and we have people who grew up in the development side. And we also have people who grew up in the IT client side, um, just troubleshooting issues and, uh, you know, fixing hardware and things like that. So uh, we, we get people from all over the place. And so the idea here is that we've got to kind of massage everybody into something where we can leverage the best of both worlds. And that's why on your dev or on your DevOps side, you really want to make sure that your team is diverse enough to have the balance that you need to, to solve your business needs. Um, so with that being said, we've got to ease the learning curve and for both of these, these groups, ops and devs, the idea of configuration management is kind of foreign, especially when you talk about the way Chef does it, which I think is a great way to do it, um, <laughs> um, in this, this very declarative way. Rather than writing a list of instructions of do this, then do this, then do this, um, we think about it in this different way of like, I declare that this thing should be like this, right? And and having a set of declarations. This file should be here with these properties. This service should have this name or the service with this name should have, uh, uh, should, should be enabled and it should start up um, with, with the operating system. And, uh, you know, we, we, we declare the way we want the system to work and then Chef takes over and does all the underpinnings that say, okay, well, if it's not like this, then I need to do this and I need to press this button and I need to click this or, well, obviously we're not, we're not clicking and pressing buttons, but you know, I need to run this command and I need to do this and that. We, we start by backing up off of the configuration management topic and just making sure that we all kind of halfway code more or less the same. So, the first bit of that, I've got this broken into two chunks. The first bit of that is that your code should be easy to read and understand. And we've got some things here that I'm going to go through. 
Um, but having code that's easy to read and understand uh, reduces the barrier to entry for new people. If I bring a new person onto my team from ops and I show them a cookbook that was written by somebody in dev and it's just got all kinds of code in there and you know we've got camel case with like short variable names and like it's it's a devs piece of work right and then another dev would totally understand it you can read the code you can see what it's doing but it's not super obvious so well commented code really really helps to um, make sure that even if somebody doesn't understand what the code is saying a good comment or a good block comment can help somebody understand what it's doing and we can kind of pick up from that comment okay so it's supposed to be reading this file and then doing something with the file and i don't understand any of that and then but it's outputting this thing and the the, the comment says i'm going to read this file i'm going to blah 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 with some regex and then i'm going to output something that looks like this and then you know you look at the code and you say okay well i don't really understand all the regex and all the stuff that it's doing but I, I can look at it and i can know because of the comment that it looks like it's doing what it says it's doing and if i need to make some modification then i can at least kind of figure out where i'm going to make a change or add something or i need to add a second file to be read or whatever um, the next section or, or the next point here is uh, complete documentation your documentation, I'm talking here about like your readme or whatever, your documentation is uh, super important to, to help not just end users understand how to use it, but help other developers and even yourself when you go back to your own work two years later, even yourself to be able to look back at that and say like, oh yeah, I had this feature here, I, I, I built that in and I, I kind of forgot that that was there or where was that thing? I knew I did something to do such and such. So that, that complete documentation is really, really gonna help everybody involved. The next point here is well-named methods and variables. And I kind of mentioned that before. And from a, a programming standpoint, this kind of has a different meaning because when we talk about well-named variables, like there's some, some language specific um, best practices that, that are really good for programmers because everybody's on the same page there, you know, like var name underscore str, we know it's going to be a string, right? Um, and we don't really need to do that so much here as much as we need to make methods and variables named in a way that's really descriptive and really clear. And one of the best examples I have for this comes up in loop variables and programmers are awesome at using just throwaway garbage variables in loops. You've got, you know, for I in call do blah, 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 right? And, and for somebody that doesn't have a programming background come into that and they look at that and they go, wait, and it's this really long loop maybe, right? And so they're like, wait, what's this I thing again? And what's call, what, what's, what's in, this, in this collection of things? I, I don't know. But if instead you said for line in file or for file in directory, right? Then as you're reading through that loop, you know that that thing that you're doing is with a file or you know that that, that thing that you're doing is a line of text in a file. And it, it breaks down that barrier to entry, which makes programming hard to read and sends people back to writing scripts. Um, now, next on the script topic, and this is maybe a little controversial here, but I'm going to say avoid wrapping scripts and calling it a day. From an ops perspective, we've got this script and the boss said, I have to use Chef now, so I used a script resource to manage it with Chef. Okay, yes, and, and there's definitely some value in, in the fact that you're doing something now that you weren't doing before, and that's managing it with Chef. But don't close the book on it, right? Come back and start extracting stuff from that script and, and really embracing the, the declarative way that you can define things. Take things out of that script. Start with simple things. Take things out of that script and just put them in as, as chef declarations. Little resources here and there that you can sprinkle throughout. And this helps 
break down the barrier on the other side of the fence, right? You've got the op guys with the scripts and, and this helps the devs be able to get in there and understand what's happening. Because when they get in there and look at your script, they've got no idea what's going on. The same way that ops doesn't have any idea what's going on when dev writes something that's really complicated with, uh, you know, fancy uh, Java style names or C++ style names. And my next point here, and like if you get nothing else from, from this talk, this is the thing you should take away. And that is thorough testing. And I can't stress this enough. You can have no documentation. You can have terribly named methods and variables. You can have just a script wrapped in a cookbook with no comments, right? But if you have thorough testing, nobody can get in there and try and do something that breaks your code without knowing they broke your code. And again, even you, two years later, when you go back to work on your, your, same, your same project again, right? Thorough testing will, will serve as documentation in a way because it, it communicates how your, your code is supposed to work, how your cookbook is supposed to work. Um, so the next section here is maintainability. And, and this goes, you know, really hand in hand with being easy to read and easy to understand. But the first point here is using the right tool for the job. And we'll get into this a, a bit more deeply later as I go through the different pieces of a cookbook. But uh, using the right tool for the job helps everybody know that, um, that if something's happening, they know where to go to look. Like, there, there's more than one way to do anything when it comes to IT and programming and, um, and Chef, right? Uh, you could just use Chef and completely not use any resources and do everything in pure Ruby, but why? <laughs> um, so use the right tool for the job, you know, use the resources that are appropriate. Don't use execute resources to create files and directories. Yeah, things like that, right? The next point here is embrace item potence. The, the whole idea of Chef is based on this idea of test and repair. So if the test passes, there is no repair. We read some information to see the state of the thing that we're looking at. And then if it's out of compliance, if it's out of convergence, then we converge it. Then we say, go ahead and, and do the action required to repair it. Um, and so when you're writing your chef code, uh, whether it's custom resources or, uh, or just your recipes or whatever, right, you really want to embrace that idea of item potence and, and make full use of it because all of the underpinnings, all of the work, the hard work is done for you to do all the comparison and stuff, all of that's already there. So all, all you have to do is, is load the current values and then chef will make sure that that they're right. Um, the, next, the next point is avoid duplicate code. Um, so what we're saying here is like, I've seen this in a couple of uh, cookbooks that I've been maintaining, where people, uh, they write up a recipe, big long recipe to do this thing. And then they say, oh, but I need to support this other operating system. Maybe it's uh, SUSE 12 SP4 they wrote it for and SUSE 15 SP1 they need to support now and it requires something different. So they copy the recipe to another recipe called SUSE SP4 or, or SUSE 15 SP4, right? And then they change a couple of things in that recipe. And they go, oh, we, we need this on Red Hat too. We've got another request. So they copy the recipe again and do it on Red Hat with a couple little changes here and there. But now you've got three copies of the same code, 100 lines, with only like two or three, maybe even only 10 lines different, right? Uh, and, and it's functional and it works. The problem is somebody reports a bug on SUSE 12 SP4, and so you go, you fix that recipe. But the bug wasn't really just SUSE 12 SP4, it happened to be everything and now you've got three different places to change the code and you have to rely on all of those three things being in sync otherwise you've got bugs you don't know about or you don't recognize because they weren't reported as bugs on those operating systems right or maybe you have an application and you need to support another version of it so you build another recipe for it 
So, so you want to avoid duplicating that code and, and everywhere you can try and simplify things down into uh, the, the least common denominator. And basically what all of this sums up to is coding in not just the same language, right? Because obviously we're pretty much doing all this in Ruby, right? But coding in the same dialect. And, and you know, you can, the U.S. is a great example. You've got a dialect in, in the South. You've got a totally different dialect in New York City. And, you know, you, another different dialect in the Midwest as on the West Coast, right? You, and, and you can take any language and, and see the same effect. The same thing happens in Mexico, right? Buddy Juan isn't isn't here with us, but uh, he was telling me like, there's some things, man, you can say in Northern Mexico that have a totally different meaning in Southern Mexico. And, and so that's, that's what we want to do here is we want to get everybody in the same dialect. So we want to do better than code that just works, which is fine. But what we want to do is have code that reads well so that everybody who gets in there can easily understand what happens. I even have my, my school-aged kids, my, my fourth grader, sometimes read over my code and tell me what it's doing, just as a check for me to make sure that I'm being very clear with what I'm doing, that my comments are really good, that my variables are really well named, and, and that I'm, I'm living up to that, that, same, that same standard, right? Um, so that's my, that's my sanity check. Um, so, so that's it for best practices. That's all I really had to say there. And now I want to get into the anatomy of the chef run and the cookbook itself. So we're going to start with the chef run, which may seem a little bit backwards, but um, trust me, I think that this is going to be really the, the best way to go here. Um, you'll notice I've got a lot of uh, like little racing analogy pictures up here. Um, and you'll also notice that the, the green flag is way to the right of the picture. So there's a lot of stuff that happens and a lot of stuff that happens really fast at the very beginning of the chef run. And, and the execution phase of the chef run is not really the star of the show. Like that's the part that should just work. Um, and we go immediately from execution to finalization. Like there's not a whole lot of magic there. So starting from the far left, you've got initialization. Sticking with the race analogy, this is where the pit crew gets together. We get all of our guys together and figure out who's doing what, what's going to happen. Talk about how the race is going to go. Talk about what we've got. We're going to read the parameters we've got. Parameters passed to the chef client executable. Parameters read, uh, read in. Uh, from like the client RB file, which controls the chef run settings. Um, we might get um, we might get some attributes passed in at that point right at the right at the command line or in a JSON file. Uh, and this is going to tell us whether we're running um, in in local mode just on this the the node or if we're running on uh, against a chef server with a managed policy, right? So this is stuff we're going to find out like way, way early on. Um, and then like Im almost immediately right after, we're going to run the OHI built-in plugins and collect any hints. So for those of you that don't know, OHI is a, uh, a tool that runs to collect data on a system, and it also picks up what are called hints. These are little files that people drop in a special place to give extra information to the chef run. Now, OHI, um, it gets built into... Uh, all of the other information, which all together is called the node object. Um, and that's, again, a programming paradigm. We abstract the idea of this, uh, this server that we're going to manage, right, into a node, and uh, it's represented purely in data. So that, that node object is a JSON representation of the machine and everything we could possibly need to know about it. So we run these built-in plugins, we run um, and check for any hints. Hints might be dropped by a hyperscaler to give additional information about the node's presence in the hyperscaler, maybe the project it's in, external IP, stuff like that. And then we get the, the run list. And that run list is either gonna come from the chef server or it's gonna be passed to the configuration to the, um, to the uh, chef client executable. 
whichever way we get the run list and then we resolve the cookbooks in the run list and all of the dependencies of those cookbooks in the run list so that we're reading the metadata of the cookbook to see of each cookbook to see what things it depends on any specific versions and then we get all that together and we move on uh, the the resolution of cookbooks if you're talking about um, a, a client that's connected to a chef server then that cookbook resolution happens by using the chef server to provide all of the cookbooks. If you're doing a, a solo run, then all the cookbooks are, are pre-provided um, before you start. Um, and then there's, there, there's other, like this is basics. There's other ways to do the chef run, like effortless config where everything's packaged into uh, a habitat package. Um, and, and there's some new functionality that's been added that changes a little bit of this. Um, if you opt into it um, in Chef 16, there's like a unified mode that changes a little bit of the way some of this stuff works. But this is like pretty much 99% of your cases are gonna work like this. And, and understand that Chef under the hood is still gonna be doing most of this stuff um, the, the same way, reading the parameters and, and resolving the cookbooks either locally or from a Chef server. Um, so, so we've got the pit crew together. Awesome. Um, but now we need to know what kind of track we're racing on. We need to know what the weather's like on the track, uh, how humid it is. Um, what's the rubber look like on the track? You know, if there, is there, is there a, you know, a groove already? Do we have a hot lane? What's going on with the track? Um, so, so when we're talking about our server, what we mean is that we're going to look at that node object. Um, you know, all of that initialization stuff was was pretty uh, pretty separated from the actual machine itself. We don't we don't have to know anything about the machine to know all that stuff. Um, so we get the node object, and what we're saying there is like if you're getting it from the the chef server, if you're connected to the chef server, you're going to pull down the existing node object state. What did this computer look like the last time I ran Chef? And then we're gonna rebuild that node object by merging in and overriding any of the OHI stuff. We're gonna run any of the OHI custom plugins that are built into the cookbooks. So if you have a cookbook where you need to collect some specific data, maybe about a database and the, uh, the users that are provisioned on that database or the security policies, right? You can use, you can write an OHI custom plugin to collect this information at the beginning of your chef run. Um, and we're gonna merge all of that into the node object and then we're gonna load the attributes. And we're gonna load the attributes from each cookbook starting with the default.rb and then we do all the rest in uh, alphabetical order. So if you have multiple uh, attribute files, which isn't super common, but uh, if you have multiple attribute files, they get loaded in order. Um, and, and so now we have a node object. We have all of the information about what, what resources, as far as like cookbooks and run lists and all that from the initialization phase, we have all of the data about the system from the collect data phase. And now we need to figure out now that we, we've got the crew, we know what the track looks like, now we need to make a plan for how we're going to actually run the race. And we do this by building up the resource collection, and this is called the compile phase. So we're gonna go through each of the recipes and run their Ruby. But before we run, run the Ruby and the recipes, we want to get any additional Ruby that we might need to complete this task. So we're gonna go through all the cookbooks, we're gonna load any additional libraries that have been uh, loaded up in the libraries folder. We'll see that in a minute. We're gonna load any additional libraries, we're gonna execute any pure Ruby because the pure Ruby in your recipes is for flow control. If you want to, like we said earlier, minimize your reduction of code, minimize your duplication of code, then we want to use looping with Ruby to say we want four packages. Well, we're gonna put the four packages in array and loop over that array to get that package resource. 
instead of writing out each package resource multiple times. It makes it easy to add or remove packages, simplifies the maintenance. So we're gonna use Ruby in the recipes to control the flow of how things get added into the resource collection. And then we're gonna add each resource to the collection. This is our tires, this is our fuel, this is our water, uh, you know, anything we need for this race, we're going to have it all ready to go. There's no going back and getting more later. You're already, the race has already started. And here we go, green flag, we're actually going to run the execution phase. So we're going to execute the resources in run list order, making call outs and substitutions where we've got uh, subscriptions being notifying other things and extra stuff happening. But everything's going to happen in the order we specified. By, by how it got added to the resource collection. At this stage, Ruby in the recipes, pure Ruby is not run, unless you've got something a little more advanced calling a, a lazy notification or something like that. The Ruby here doesn't get run. We run through all the resources in order. Great, we're done. Checkered flag. We're gonna collect the state and send a report back up to the chef server along with the node object. Now we only send that node object, by the way, back up to the chef server if there is a, um, a successful run. Okay, so based on what we've just uh, talked about, looking at this code example, you should be able to see pretty easily why uh, this, this doesn't really work the way you might think it would work. So uh, do I have some drawing tools here? I do not. So uh, looking at the first section, we're writing a file in the location temp hello, and we're giving it some content. And a couple lines down, we're getting a variable, and we're going to read from the path temp hello. And we're going to write that content to another file called temp ole. Uh, but this doesn't work, right? Because the content we're passing is, is from this Ruby statement that's reading from a file that on the first run of this doesn't even exist, right? So if we look back at this, we're, we're running that Ruby over here and we're not gonna get anything there. This is gonna be an error. You can't read from a file that doesn't exist, right? So, so this is an example of, of you know, something that's not going to work based on the, the way the chef run is gonna compile that. And this is because you're using Ruby uh, for a purpose other than flow control. And this is something you need to watch out for in your code. Um, and hopefully this session is gonna help you understand that, that flow so that you can uh, avoid and identify problems like this. So the next thing we're gonna go over is what's in a cookbook. And um, we're gonna start with attributes. I'm just gonna do these in order. What we're looking at here on the left-hand side is a snapshot of um, our SAP development, um, uh, temporary, uh, sorry, uh, generated cookbook. It's our, our base cookbook, our example. This is where all of our cookbooks get, get life. So the first thing here is attributes. Um, you should use attributes only to define values for user configurable options. Now, aligning with the paradigm of reduction of you know, duplicate code, you may not want to write out uh, or hard code values that you're gonna reuse in a lot of places. Attributes might not be your best solution for that. And we'll get down to libraries in a minute and you'll see why. But um, attributes is where you want users to be able to change things. A really great example of this is I was working on a security hardening cookbook recently and uh, a bunch of the security policies were attributes. And I was like, wow, you really don't want your users to be able to change your hardening policies. Like that, that's pretty hard and fast. So that's a situation where you wanna, you wanna keep that stuff out of the attributes. Um, files. Files are static files that you want to exist on the node and you load these with the cookbook file resource. Um, so this is any just plain text configuration file, whatever, just a regular old file that you want to exist. They can be binaries, but they generally, it's generally discouraged because it makes the cookbooks big and clunky and hard to move around and transport. Um, 
onto servers and off of servers and stuff. Um, so, so it's generally recommended to just keep these simple. Um, so libraries, here's the right place for all that logical code that you want to do weird things with your text like regex and you want to um, extend a Ruby class or a chef class to do something new. Um, this is the right place to set up uh, definitions or variables that you want to expose to uh, the recipes or the resources that you're going to use. And this is a great place to store variables that you're going to use throughout uh, in a single place where you can, you can access them easily. OHI, so this is where you're going to store custom OHI plugins. This is the bit where you write some code to get the state of the system uh, or some very specific bit of uh, configuration that's uh, special to you or your team or your your application. Recipes. So this is where all of the resources go. Recipes should contain uh, all of your resources and enough code to control how those resources are added into the resource collection. Uh, resources are where you add custom resource functionality. So you want to do a thing and a really common example of this is taking uh, a more complex process. You've got a package that's uh, zipped up in a repository somewhere uh, and it has a configuration file with it. So you can't just grab it down and run the, the package resource on it. You actually have to bring it down using a remote file, unzip it using a uh, Windows zip file or something like that, right? You unzip the file and then you run the uh, the resource, uh, the package resource on it, and then you want to clean up those files, right? I mean, there's there's some steps here, and you don't really need to clutter your recipe with all those steps, especially if you're having to do anything extra, extra special, like read from that configuration file to pull out uh, specific strings and add them to the command line, right? I mean, everything gets a little a little more hairy there. So what you really want to do then is you can wrap all of this stuff in a custom resource uh, where you can use a mix of Ruby and um, chef code. And this will help simplify your recipe because nobody going to maintain your recipe really cares all the stuff you had to go through to load that file out of that zip, right? They just want to know, okay, he installed that package. Gotcha. And then if they really need to, to get deeper into it, then you know you're you can go into that custom resource and inspect what's happening and, and make changes there if you need to add functionality. Um, templates. Templates are just like files, but with injectable variables, and we call these with the template file resource. This allows us to to make uh, customizable um, files where we can change the contents by injecting variables or things from the node object, attributes, all that stuff. And finally, your test is for all of your development testing. Make note that this is not used in production. When you move your, your cookbook up to a chef server, the test folder does not go along with it. It's only used for, for development testing and it should follow your repo and live in your repo, but it won't live in your production environments when you look at your cookbooks on your servers. Uh, the next section is the kitchen file. So using test kitchen, um, which is kind of the, the best practice to start with all of the, um, the basic examples you'll see, right? Uh, we have ours broken down into specific hyperscalers, but uh, you use your testing profiles to define platforms, test suites, set attributes. This is the place where if you have some specific functionality that you've enabled that branches off from, from another uh, default workflow, that you should have a, a, a suite to test that. If uh, you, know, you have an option to, in, to have a 64-bit application or 32-bit application, you should have a test suite for each of those so that you can ensure that they both do what they're supposed to do. The Burks file is how we define the resolution of cookbooks for testing. The number one um, 
thing that the Burks file does is it just points back to the metadata, which we're going to get to in a minute. But the other thing you can do with the Burks file is you can add additional cookbooks for um, that are required for testing, but that aren't actually dependencies of your cookbook. So a great example of this is if I if I was writing a cookbook to install an application into a database, right? Like WordPress, for example, right? If I was gonna write a cookbook to install WordPress, um, well, my cookbook wouldn't really depend on any specific database. It would have to know which database it's installing into, but it wouldn't actually depend or be responsible for installing that database. It would assume that it's already there, but when testing it, I would need to install the database. That would be my responsibility, is to make sure that I have a database available for my kitchen to run against. Uh, so in the Burks file, you might define uh, a dependency, a testing dependency for another cookbook, like uh, MySQL, right? Um, the Chef Ignore is a list of things to skip when uploading things to a Chef server. So if you have other stuff in your, in your um, repository, like maybe stuff for your CI, um, things that aren't important to the chef server or to the nodes that are going to be running your cookbook, you can add them into the, the chef ignore. And the super magic metadata.rb is where you keep all this super cool information about your cookbook. So in here, you've got your dependencies, your version, author, um, what supported versions it has. And all of this stuff magically bubbles up if you're using, using the chef server, um, bubbles up into the chef server's policy area when you look at the cookbook. So you can see what versions of the cookbook there are on the chef server and all sorts of other awesomely magical stuff. Your readme is obviously where you're going to explain the intended use of your cookbook, what your attributes control, and, and really lay out what your expected behavior for the cookbook is going to be in a very human readable way. And finally, the testing MD, if you have one in there, is going to set forth information about how your test profiles work, any prerequisites or gotchas. If you uh, are writing a super specific cookbook for like a team that has uh, special servers and you have to go talk to this guy in this department to provision a server for you to test on, this would be a good place to put like really specific information like that. And finally on to the uh, infra server and scaling this idea of a single node chef run to multiple uh, even thousands and thousands of servers. Um, so what I'm going to show you here is some screenshots from the Chef Manage server, which is what you'll see if you're playing around with um, if you're playing around with uh, tutorials or examples online. Um, they're generally going to have you set up a hosted Chef account, and so this is what you'll see in there. If you're running an enterprise uh, like automation server or something like that, things may look a little bit different, but they're going to be pretty much um, pretty much all the same, just in different places. Um, so the first thing we've got under the administration tab is your organizations. Organizations allow you to basically multi-tenant your chef server. So you can have different organizations for different lines of businesses, for distinct um, application landscapes, for unrelated applications. Um, so this, this is where, where organizations will come in handy. Um, to, to help segregate so you don't have all the cookbooks for your entire enterprise in one giant organization. Um, environments you can use to set up dev, test, stage, prod uh, environments. Environments are kind of similar to roles. There's a lot of uh, crossover there, but basically the idea is that the environments allow you to, to predefine um, the, the dependency constraints that you have on different um, different servers. Um, your roles can help you define baseline policies. So these are used to disperse across multiple different environments, um, multiple different like stages and stuff, right? So you might have a role that, as you can see here, is like your base role. This might be your basic security policy all the servers have to meet these requirements. They all have to be configured this way to be one of our servers. Everybody gets this, 
right? And then your web might have a bunch of cookbooks uh, that define not just uh, that a web server be installed, but what the uh, what the landing page looks like, right? You might have your your basic um, API test stuff coming back into the web here, and then. Uh, and you can also define attributes there too. Data bags are where you store secret information like passwords, key files. Each data bag can be individually controlled uh, as far as who gets access to that data bag, um, which clients even, or which, um, which user roles or which specific users have what level of access to the data in that data bag. And then finally, the super magic about all of this is that uh, is keeping with the, the idea of code, uh, infrastructure as code, this whole chef server can be managed with code. And so here you've got an example of uh, an empty wireframe of a chef server, but you have data bags, environments, and roles all in here that can be stored in a code repository somewhere. And obviously if you've got secrets and passwords and key files, you should keep those uh, repos very secure. But um, yeah, so you've got all that stuff there. Uh, finally, I wanted to leave you guys with some documentation um, and additional resources. So um, there's some links here for documentation to uh, the cookbook reference, uh, the custom resource reference, and the OHI reference. Uh, you've also got some community support available. There's an awesome Slack community. And if you're not a part of it yet, there's a link there to sign up. You can also uh, send a mail to the mailing list at chef at discoursemail.com. And there's a, a chef tag on Stack Overflow where the community answers all sorts of questions from, uh, from out in the wild. In addition, there are some really cool videos out there. Um, if you look at uh, Get Chef uh, on YouTube, also you can look at The Joy of Automating. There was a series done a few years ago that um, really digs in in a very approachable way to um, coding and and does really great investigation on like how to look into the code and figure things out and um, answer your questions. And then finally, uh, all of your stuff at learn.chef.io, which they update constantly and is another great res resource. And thanks. That was that was crazy. That was uh, really exhaustive. Um, I do have one question just to kick us off We're right at the top of the hour, but we'll take a few questions if people have them. Go ahead and use the Q&A window. Uh, I wanted to know, um, you, you kind of mentioned um, like uh, talking through like comments and like other things to help uh, other developers understand uh, code in cookbooks and stuff like that. Do you guys also use any kind of code review process or anything like that? We do have a code review process. We, we call it four eyes. Um, so every, every cookbook, and, and we've changed this, it's um, been done a couple different ways over the years, but every, every time a, a developer writes a change, they submit a pull request and they have to have that code approved um, by, uh, by somebody. At, at one point it was, they had to have the code approved by, uh, just another developer. And then later we have a technical specialist looking at, at, all, at all of the reviews. Um, since we're a, a very global team, we, um, we have a, a, a regional set of technical specialists so that nobody is waiting for another time zone to check in. Oh, Does that make nice. sense? Yeah, um, so we've got we've got three regional um, technical specialist code reviewers, and so they do their own code, right? And then when uh, when somebody submits a, a pull request, then they get um, they get notified. And then also in that, like we don't really do the code reviews until the CI has has passed. Mm -hmm. So we've got CI running all those test kitchen suites automatically, and then um, when the CI passes then we do a code review to check everything else. Cool. We've got two questions in the, in the Q&A there. The first one is, uh, at what stage would you load an audit cookbook or a compliance cookbook? Do you have preferences for, that, for when you add those? 
Yeah, um, when you talk about stage, I'm going to back up a little bit. I, are you talking about like environment stages, like dev test stage prod, or are you talking about like where in the run list? Um, so uh, as far as environments are concerned, I would say all of them need to have it. As far as where in the run list, um, Generally, I would say that like any kind of security cookbook should be at the at the lowest level, right? Run run at the very beginning. And since we're doing test and check, like it almost becomes irrelevant because um, you don't have to worry too much about things getting overridden. If it's managed, if you're running it as a service periodically, then you know every hour, two hours, you know, you're, you're ensuring again that that thing is, is compliant. And you should have some monitoring telling you if certain resources continue to get updated on a server, that means that something is broken, right? Cool. So uh, I hope that answered the question. If not, just keep yeah. going on it. This is where in the run list. So I think you got that one. Uh, the next one, um, can you briefly talk about maybe your top have, uh, current challenges like what are things that are sort of uh, that you're working on right now that are challenging for your team yeah i mean as a, as a team i think the the biggest challenges one is just being global and um like any development team we've got those those um certain people who have really deep knowledge in one area or another and um, trying to help those people spread that knowledge around the globe so that other people can take advantage of it um, I think another another big challenge is just um, getting everybody uh, like onboarded, especially new employees, like getting them comfortable with Chef. Like there's a huge learning curve here and every every enterprise is going to do things like a little bit differently. Right. I know for me personally, when I first started with Chef, we had this wacky, wacky way of running Chef and like I didn't even know where to begin because there wasn't really great documentation internally and the documentation online was having me do stuff in a totally different way because we weren't using a chef server and like so so just really trying to make things clear and stay connected to onboarding people um, and for us that means like onboarding onto our team or even onboarding like development teams that have like a DevOps champion right onboarding them and keeping them included and feeling connected to the process is uh it's a challenge but it's a super important thing to do absolutely uh next question is uh does sap use custom cook style or uh food credit food credit gets deprecated uh cook style <laughs> rules uh to help maintain a consistent approach yeah yeah um to to hammer on that um point that you made food critic is um, deprecated now that chef 16 is released with the latest version of chef workstation all of the food critic rules have now been built into cook style cops that can actually take action with the automatic um, with the automatic fixes um, but we don't have necessarily a set of custom rules we do have some things that we exclude and some things that we um, don't use in cook style. We also have some extra stuff that that we do custom. Um, but there's only so much of our, our our stuff as far as like comments, commenting code and well documented and well well named variables that you can actually build into an automated cop. Um, and a lot of it just requires that that second set of eyes in a manual code review. Excellent. Uh, next question. Uh, you guys are still talking about uh, Burke's files, but have you uh, worked with policy files uh, and how would you uh, fix them into what you're currently doing? Yeah, great question. And no, we, we do not, um, in SAP, our team right now, we do not mess with policy files. Um, we, I, I mentioned this really old archaic infrastructure um, that I, I started on like four years ago, five years ago, and that was running Chef 11, which was already end of life, by the way, um, when we were using it. And, and back then we were using uh, Librarian. 
which was also deprecated. Oh my and so like th there was a huge process to get everybody onto Burks and people wanted to keep going back to librarian because it's what they knew. And, and we finally got everybody onto Burks and now we're on Burks and uh, you know, we're just, we're just, it's been a year or two and we're just finally breathing from that. Um, so I haven't, I haven't gotten to the point of trying to introduce policy files yet. Honestly, with what we're doing and the way our team works, um, the, the Burks files are working really well for us and we don't see a whole lot of advantage to policy files for us, but they do have a lot of, um, a, a lot of use if you're managing um, more applications, whereas we're working like a lot with dev teams and writing automation and helping them write automation for a lot of different things. Cool. Uh, so um, Anthony in the audience is going through a POC for Chef and would like to know if there are some things you'd suggest they look out for or any gotchas that you've experienced. Mm. Um, that's a really hard one, you know, because at that POC stage, you're still really kind of learning what Chef can do for you. I think the biggest gotcha, I would say, is like the stuff that I've talked about in this talk, and that's... Um, getting everybody on the same page with how you're going to do whatever it is you're going to do like make some decisions and and like don't hold hard and fast but make some decisions and everybody stick with them and then evaluate and come back to it and see how it went and and be okay to fail like i i can't tell you how many times i've heard that in chef talks but like failure has to be a part of the process or you're not going to learn or you're just going to have a broken system that everybody hates using, right? Be okay with failing and coming up with solutions and, and go in and, and reevaluate what you're doing every once in a while. I mean, like I said, we started with librarian and we had to reevaluate, get on Burks, and maybe we'll reevaluate and move over to policy files if we see some benefit there, right? Yeah, and that leads into the next question, actually. Um, since you're a very large global company, you know, keeping up with the pace of, of how things change with Chef. I mean, you guys have been using Chef since before we adopted our current sort of release schedule. Um, now that we're sort of doing a major version every April, um, right. we used to do that. So um, what kinds of, of, how do you guys like parse that or keep in mind like what's going on and keeping up to date, especially with like cookbooks and how the resources change and, and that sort of thing? Right. Yeah, that's a great question. And and the new chef workstation is going to help us a lot going forward with that because uh, all those new cops, you can target to a specific chef version. So say, for example, like we're on chef 14 right now. And if we wanted to, to see the upgrade path to chef 15, we could run all of those cook style um, cops against the chef 15 version and see anything that's been deprecated really easily. Um, so that's, that's, one very awesome tool to do that. Um, what we do, like it's kind of unreasonable for us to manage a chef uh, upgrade every year. Um, it's a long process. We're managing thousands and thousands of servers and uh, hundreds of development teams with different environments and, and different applications and support teams. And like, there are a lot of people to deal with when we do an upgrade. So uh, we, we do every two years, um, or that's what we've been doing since Chef 12 released. Um, we, we finally got off Chef 11 and 11 to 12 was so hard. There was like so much change. Yeah. And, uh, and then we went from, from 12 to 14 and that was pretty painless and we'll do 12 to 16. Um, what we have is a couple of teams that um, have some, that have a really good set of stages. Like not all dev teams are gonna follow this you know, dev test stage prod thing, but some of them do, some of them have a really good set. And so we run, um, run our upgrades in dev on, on their dev machines and, and check things out. But we've also got some 300 cookbooks that we manage. So there's a lot to make sure that we're like getting every cookbook and figuring out what's really being used and what's not. Yeah, so data, nice it's, too. yeah, it's, it's really, really about data, who's using what, being able to, like it was like I started to talk with insight to action, right? See see where our big hotspots on the cookbooks are, and uh, upgrade those with priority. Cool. 
for new employees? Like what kind of uh, advice do you give them if this is their uh, first experience with this kind of automation or these kinds of tools? Yeah, the, the biggest thing for a new employee is uh, first to, to get an understanding of where they come from, right? Um, and then you can kind of tailor the experience and the onboarding process to them. Uh, what I usually do is if I have the time, um, and if they have no previous experience, I give them one of these talks and talk to them about all the other tools we use. Like we have a ticketing tool that we use and, um, you know, we've got like Slack and, you know, how all these things fit together in our, in our workflow. Um, and then I give them uh, a, a lot the same you would see in, in one of the examples or the tutorials. I give them uh, an assignment that's a very basic cookbook and I ask them to set it up for Windows and Red Hat, and it's usually like an HTTP type of cookbook, you know, make a web server, and they've got to do all of the things around that, right? They've got to write the tests, they've got to write the documentation, they've got to write the recipes. Usually I've got something thrown in there where they might need to write a custom resource or an OHI plugin so that I, I can get them to a place where they feel comfortable. And then I just shred their code. <laughs> it sounds terrible, but like, you know, I go back to the only way you can learn is to fail and learn from that. You can read all the books in the world and you might pick some stuff up if you're Bill Gates, but really you've just got to get in there and fail and learn and fail and learn and fail and just keep doing it. Um, and, and I think that's the best way. So I, again, that constant communication is super important, right? I stay right on top of these guys when I'm onboarding them because I don't want them to get discouraged. I want them to be encouraged by the fact that I'm right there and I'm going to help them through this. Awesome. All right. Anthony wants the dirt. So last question. He says, um, how have you found your relationship with chef change over the years? Um, uh, and he, he's like, please describe the good, the bad, or the ugly. Uh, let's leave out the ugly if there's ugly, uh, just for today. Um, but yeah, like you guys have been around a very long time. This is not your first time talking at ChefCov. Um, we've heard a lot of great stories out of SAP over the years. So um, what's it like on your end? Yeah, I think our relationship with Chef has, I would say, improved over the years. Um, Chef's always been pretty responsive to, to bugs that we create or um, feature requests we submit, um, pull requests we submit. Um, I would say over the last couple of years, there's been uh, increased engagement um, from Chef. Uh, they're, they're really putting a lot of um, work into, uh, you know, keeping on top of us, like I try and keep on top of my developers, right? Keeping on top of us and making sure that our needs are met or that they're answering questions. We've got a super awesome support guy uh, call out to to Steve, um, and uh, you know, and 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 really, just Chef is a, a big old company full of smiling faces. Like everybody wants to be helpful and uh, be there and be supportive. So uh, I would say that that it's been a really really positive and increasingly positive experience. Awesome, and we like having you guys around. So I think that's it for today. I will ask you uh, one more thing. So I think my man behind the curtain has fixed our video problem. So if you could see, uh, if you could start your video before um, I close. Oh yeah, give me one time. second so that Test I can this uh, out here. make sure that I'm ready for that. Oh dear. No, it's not working. No, still not. All right. Well, we'll keep working on that. But for everybody else, thank you. Uh, thanks for coming. Stay safe, wash hands. Uh, and we'll hope to see you next year. And thanks so much to, to Dan and Joe. Sure thing. Have a great day, everybody.